Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. My name is Manuel and today we are continuing our walkthrough of the schematic for my CubeSat EPS. In case you haven't seen the first part, I recommend you go watch that first. Otherwise, let's get started. All right, so let's talk about the connectors we are going to need on this EPS. Um, we basically need to make two kinds of connections. On one hand, we want to connect the PCB to the panels, so to the sides of the CubeSat, because that's where the solar cells will be. And on the other hand, we need a way to connect the EPS to the stack of uh, PCBs above and below it. So for the panel connectors, I am going with just um, pins and pin receptacles. And I intend to put uh, 16 individual pins on each of the four sides of the CubeSat. This may seem like a lot, and it probably is a lot, but I think the, the side panels are kind of a lot of um, PCB real estate, if you will. And I would like to future-proof this in a way so we can, you know, we have some room to grow into this. Um, at the moment, only half of these pins are even connected, so yeah, let's see what's here. On the top, we just have the VPV, so the solar cell power that's coming from the solar cells. Then we have two um, separate uh, enable signals. These will be used to enable or disable the sensors on the panels. And I'm thinking about um, voltage and current sensors and, of course, temperature, which will be important. There is a provision to, to enable each of the sites individually, but I think for now it will be enough if we enable them in groups of two sites. Maybe about um, a word about nomenclature. Usually in a CAD model you use um, X minus and X plus, Y minus and Y plus, and um, C minus and C plus to denote um, orientations or sites of something. I try to use alphanumerics whenever possible, so I'm not using the minus and plus signs, but I'm writing M and P instead. So I just group the X and Y minus and the plus sides together. These are normally pulled down to ground, so this activated through these pull down resistors, because um, I think we don't need to have them running all the time, and I would prefer to um, be able to uh, activate them manually. So next up, is just um, supply voltage for the sensors on the panels and this here is actually a an idea for the future so the rbf pin normally is a pretty hefty kind of um, well it's a steel pin it does take up quite a bit of volume in my opinion which is kind of valuable in a cube set so i had the idea that it may be um, possible albeit a bit non-standard to have an RBF panel instead on the outside. So that's why I already included the RBF line going to the panels as well. Uh, yeah, it may not lead anywhere, but we'll see. Then down here we have a bunch of um, I squared C connections. And if we step in here, I have already included notes about orientation, which is probably a bit um, unusual for a schematic, but it kind of helped me visualize what will go where already at this stage. So other than this, there is not that much going on here. It's, these are just the connections we just saw. Some TVS diodes for the um, solar power inputs here to protect against um, electrostatic discharge. And this is also another thing for the future. I read about the possibility of using PCB coils as magnet torquers. And I wanted to explore this a bit more because it would be super space efficient. So um, the pin isn't connected to anything yet, but I just included this note that it may be used as a magnet torquer supply, power supply in the future. These are the pin receptacles that I think of using uh, for this. And I'm not fully uh, I'm clear on how this is going to be realized in hardware, but these are just basically rows of these pin receptacles. Maybe we'll talk more about this in the structure update that is coming um, probably sometime in September. So let's look at the PCB stack connectors next. I already talked about this in a previous episode, but I kind of got inspired by SparkFun's Micromod ecosystem for this. 
that's uh, a line of products they have where they sell um, microcontroller boards and what they call function boards that are getting connected on a carrier board basically using M.2 connectors. And I kind of um, like the idea of using an M.2 connector with a different pinout and basically adapting it to a specific use case and that's what I am intending to do with um, with the PCB stack. I'm calling this Macromod for the moment, but if you have a better idea or any idea at all what to call this, please let me know. So as you can see here, there are a lot of pins that are not connected at the moment and this too is just um, room for expansion in the future. The pins that are connected are the main uh, 5 volt power supplies and the main 3.3 volt power supplies as well as the LDO auxiliary power supply. Then we have the uh, inhibits here, so the RBF and deploy one and two, and the global enable system signal. Other than that, we just have um, four I squared C buses. I'm not sure if I have already mentioned this, but I would like to have um, two of these stacks of Macromod connectors um, one on the Y minus side and one on the Y plus side. So one whole bus can go down and we still retain a lot of functionality. So that's why there are four I squared C lanes here, um, two for each side. If we step into this sheet, uh, we see the actual M.2 connectors. So these four parts here. There is uh, not too much going on, I just broken out the pins that need breaking out. The more interesting part here is this pinout that I have come up with. So this is just, you know, a first, a very first draft. And as you see, a lot of the pins aren't even connected yet. So there's kind of a lot of um, room for adding more signals or more power. The only pins I have not mentioned yet are, is this pair of um, CAN bus lines that I would like to use to uh, communicate between microcontrollers. This is a suggestion I got from a viewer, so um, thank you very much. And yeah, other than that, oh yeah, maybe we would like to mention, we would need to mention the current rating on the M.2 connectors. Um, they are rated for a max of 0.5 amps per pin. So for the 5 volt bus, I'm using 5 pins, which comes out to 2.5 amps per connector. And since we are using 4 connectors on the PCB, we get 10 amps in total, like system-wide, at 5 volts and another 12 amps at 3.3 volts. Um, I think this will be enough. Well, I hope it will be enough. And also we... Um, need to take into consideration that as heat doesn't get convected away uh, in a vacuum, there may be some derating on this 0.5 amps per pin figure. But this is something that we will see during testing of this whole thing. So let's go back to the main sheet now. So let's talk about this GPIO expander sheet next. Um, these are just basically two, um, well, GPIO expanders. It's the same TCAL9539 component we have seen before. And they are both connected to the same inputs, but they are connected to um, different I squared C lines. So one on the A bus and one on the B bus. And um, I'd like to use them for, um, you know, various status outputs. So the battery chargers output a fault or a charge signal. The switching voltage regulator also outputs an analog um, fault output. And these are the ones that I would like to read with, this, uh, with these GPIO expanders. And we also need some manual control over the battery chargers. And we would like to switch um, voltage rails on or off for power cycling stuff. And we would also like to be able to um, turn the panel sensors on or off. So all of this goes here. Um, yeah, that's kind of actually kind of an important part for manually controlling the EPS functions and collecting telemetry. Other than that, we just have some test points and fiducials, actually just a ground and a VBAT test point. Uh, the fiducials are not strictly necessary right now, but I would like to get a Lumen pick and place machine at some point. So I figured it can't hurt to already include them. 
down here we have a general note um, that I am trying to use 0603 package sizes for all the passives. This is mainly because 0603 is reasonable to assemble by hand and it also works well with lower cost pick and place machines. Um, capacitors should have an X7R temperature coefficient. Uh, this only applies for um, qualification and flight hardware. Um, if you're not familiar with, with this, um, X means that the minimal operating temperature is I think minus 55 degrees Celsius. The 7 means the maximum operating temperature is 125 and R means that the maximum capacity change in, these, in this temperature gradient is plus minus 15%. So x r caps tend to be uh, a bit more expensive. If you are just, you know, prototyping and playing around with this, you can absolutely use um, more uh, affordable capacitors. This basically also goes for every other component here. I try to not use any uh, specifically high, reliable, high reliability parts or any military grade parts or even aerospace grade parts because they tend to be absurdly expensive. And it also, it goes, actually it also goes for redundancy. If you, at some point when there's a layout for all of this, if you decide to put one of those together for yourself, you can just skip a lot of the redundant parts. You just you can just not place them. And you can you're absolutely free to choose more affordable parts. So it is kind of important for me to keep the barrier to entry to um, working with this as low as possible. So that's why I noted that it would make sense to use um, X7R caps for flight, but you know, if you're staying on this planet, you can absolutely use more affordable parts. Let's maybe now talk about this whole situation up here. So as I have also mentioned in a previous episode, I would like to use um, analog devices micromodules for both the battery chargers and the switching voltage regulators. Micromodules are highly integrated, um, pretty cool little parts that are super easy to implement. I think that's the whole idea. You only need to add a few passives and you're basically all set. I'd like to use those because, well, because of this and also because they check all the boxes um, of what I need for this EPS. But I do see a very strong possibility that not everybody would like to use those because they are kind of expensive. So with the battery chargers as well as the voltage regulators, I would like to offer some flexibility for people to develop their own modules basically without having to redo the whole board or to actually even use um, compatible parts from other vendors. And in order to provide some flexibility here, I would like to make these four parts as basically solder on modules. I'm thinking about one inch square sized PCBs with um, castellated holes on the edges that you could just um, solder onto the main EPS PCB. Hey, Editing Manuel here. What I forgot to mention at this point is that the footprint I chose for these solder on modules is actually compatible with a range of Pololu uh, step down voltage reg regulators. These are, um, you know, smallish one by one inch voltage regulators that come in a variety of output voltages and are also not exactly cheap, but at least somewhat affordable. So at least for the voltage regulator side of things, there is already an uh, off-the-shelf alternative that you could use in this design. So back to the main programming now. So if we now take a closer look at the battery charger module, on the input side, we have the uh, solar power that goes into VPV here. You have an enable pin that is normally pulled up to VBAT, but we can choose to disable it to pull it down through this um, MOSFET. The NTC is going to the temperature sensor that we saw when we talked about the battery pack. And there is a 3.3 volt input. I think it's getting used as a reference voltage in the battery charger micromodule. On the output side, we are connecting to VBAT. That's where the current flows into the battery. And we have these two charging and fault open drain outputs. Now open drain means that they are active when they are pulled low. The, um, the B module is very similar. 
Only difference here is that it automatically turns on if there is a fault on the A module, but we can override this with this um, input here. If we go into the sheet, there's actually not that much going on. This is a custom symbol I made. Uh, maybe I can even show you the footprint and it needs to load. Yeah, there we go. It is really just um, a very basic footprint. It's actually uh, based on the solder party um, RP2040 module, which, which they have provided um, as public domain, which is nice, so thank you. And I've just uh, changed the, pin, the pins and the spacings around a bit. Let's go back to the main sheet and look at the switching voltage regulators. Of course, we are going to talk about the schematics for the modules themselves in just a few minutes, but I just want to, you know, talk about how they are connected to the EPS here. So there isn't that much more going on. Um, we have, as we have mentioned, two output channels per voltage regulator. Sorry, these are of course not the output channels. Um, these are the output channels, but there is an individual enable pin for each channel. It is usually pulled up to enable system, but it can be overridden again through the GPIO expander with these nets here. Um, on the output side, we of course get our main 3.3 and 5 volts as well as um, I2C telemetry because these micromodules actually have built in I2C. Oh, and I think I haven't even mentioned this yet. As far as I'm aware, I2C should be able to work with multiple microcontrollers on the same bus. I have never tried this, I have read that it should be possible, but I intend to play it safe for this version. So all of this telemetry is only going to um, the A bus. Of course, it would be nice to have all the telemetry on both buses, but for now this will be just fine. So if we go into here, we see exactly the same thing with the same footprint or the same symbol. Another note before we jump into the module schematics is that there's probably, there are probably a few components missing. For example, I did not implement any filtering, mainly because I don't know enough about filtering. Um, so I only try to use the components that I know what their purpose actually is. It is kind of a minimal design in that regard, but um, I think it should be a bit easier to troubleshoot and debug um, if there are less components and I can always just add more in the next revision. So yeah, let's now look at the battery charger and the voltage regulator modules, which are in um, separate KiCad projects because they are going to be separate boards. So we are here in the battery charger module schematic. And as you can see, there's not too much going on. The star of the show is definitely this big LTM 8062A footprint. You may have heard me talk about um, these micromodules in a previous episode. Um, these are basically just um, large-ish ICs that are highly integrated. They're made by analog devices with the idea that you don't have to add too many passives and that they are super easy to integrate. It is a, an LGA package though, so a linear grid array, so it will be a bit tricky to solder, but um, I have soldered BGA before on a hot plate, so I hope that I will manage. So there are a bunch of pins. Uh, luckily, we not only have the, um, the data sheet with the typical application down here, but also they have also published a schematic for the eval kit. So we should be fine. Now, all the pins down here are just connected to ground. We basically only need to adjust the implementation for two values. That are, these are the maximum power point for the solar cells. So the voltage at which they output the most current, basically, um, and the battery voltage. And luckily, the data sheet provides us with all the needed formulas. I have included a few screenshots here from the data sheet. Basically, in this table here, we can look up our battery voltage and our um, solar cell MPPT voltage and find out which um, input capacitance we need and which uh, resistors we need, resistor divider values we need to set for the battery voltage. 
So our battery voltage is 7.2 volts and our um, solar panels, that's this um, screenshot down here, they output 5.58 volts. That's their maximum power point. So since we have two of those in series on each solar cell module, we get 11.16 volts at the maximum power point. And as we can see here, 11.6 falls nicely into this V in range. So this table tells us that we need um, a 4.7 microfarad capacitor with a X7R rating. So that's the um, temperature coefficient rating and a 50 volt tolerance. And that we need to implement this um, resistor divider network for the battery voltage. Also, there is another formula. We need a way to tell the, the module the, the maximum power point. So there's this formula that sets the, that calculates the R in value. So for two of our um, solar cells in series, we get a RN value of three, 313 ohms. This is basically this resistor up here that goes from um, VPV to VNREC. Now, now there's a tricky thing. Since they have also published the schematic for the eval kit, I kind of took a glance there and saw that they have provided a bunch more input capacitance than the 4.7 microfarads that they stated in the, form in the, in the table. So they have, um, close to the IC, they have a 22 microfarad and a, a 22 mi uh, microfarad that's polarized and a, a 10 microfarad that's unpolarized. So the unpolarized one is probably a ceramic capacitor and the polarized one is probably a tantalum or tantalum polymer or a, a electrolytic capacitor, I don't know. But of course, but obviously there is more um, input capacitance. There are two more capacitors here to the left, but I think that's mainly because the trace is really long from the input here, from the V in on the eval kit to the actual IC. So we don't really need to worry about those, I think. So going back to the schematic, I did the same. I also placed a 10U and a 22U. Um, the 10 is a ceramic and the 22 is a tantalum polymer. The thing is the 22U is really, really big. Yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough space on the, on the module. So I may have to um, swap this out for two more 10U caps. We'll see about this. The next thing to consider is that there is an option to use the built-in reverse polarity protection with these VNA pins. Um, I opted not to do so because um, I would like it to design in a way that it's basically impossible to um, insert the solar cell modules in a reverse uh, configuration. So if we use the regular VN pins instead, we don't get the 0 0.4 0 0.5 volt drop on the internal shot key diode. Now on the output side, we have a bunch of connections for the battery and the out output cap, it's also a 22U. I think I also took this value from the eval kit schematic. They actually have a, um, a 47 microfarad output cap here. I'm not sure why I only placed a 22. Yeah, I may have to look into this. But yeah, we need some kind of output capacitance. And these are the two, um, this is the resistor divider arrangement that we saw the values for uh, in the, from the table, um, which sets the, the battery voltage, basically. There is a need for a bias voltage, as I think I've uh, mentioned before. That's the 3.3 volts we get from the EPS, from the LDOs. And there are two outputs for a charge signal and a fault signal, signal again. These are open drain outputs that are pulled low if they are um, active. And I think this is all for the micromodule. So that's a rather easy implementation. Here we have the um, footprints or the symbols for the castellated edges. I would like the um, stamp sized module to have castellated edges so we can solder it onto the main EPS board. 
And yeah, there is nothing too interesting going on here. It's just the connections to the, um, to the IC. So these footprints are just rows of castellated through holes. Um, and my plan is to just draw the edge cuts, the edge cuts right through the center on each side. And uh, this should give us, uh, well, castellated holes. Of course, I will have to communicate this to my fab house when it's time to fab the PCBs. Um, yeah, that's it for the LTM8062 module. Let's maybe look at the voltage regulator modules next. Now, this is the schematic for the LTM4675 voltage regulator module. I am not sure if I have mentioned this, but of course the schematics for the modules are also freely available and public domain, so you'll find them in the repo. And this is basically um, very similar to the other uh, module. It's also just a highly integrated um, IC. This is a BGA, so a ball grid array, while the other was an, a linear grid array. The implementation here was slightly more um, involved, as you can see here. But it's, I mean, also for this one, I had the data sheet and the uh, a schematic for the eval kit, so I kind of um, went along with whatever they did there. To be really honest, I didn't fully um, deeply research what of all what what all of these pins actually do. Um, some some of those that seemed kind of um, relevant, I broke out into test pads, but other than that, I just basically, you know, followed the demo um, implementation. Now, there is a bunch more input and output capacitance, as you see up here. I think I pretty much followed the manufacturer's recommendations on these. There is, uh, well, this up here to the left is the input from the battery, and there are two outputs. So V out is down here to the left, and uh, V out zero is down there, and V out one is up here to the right. Other than this, what else? Ah, yeah, exactly. So these um, outputs are adjustable and um, what we would like to get is 3.3 volts and 5 volts because these are our system voltages. Now I think <laughs> the data sheet is pretty extensive, I didn't read all of it. I think right now that you can either adjust the voltages through I2C or through uh, applying the right um, resistors. Now there is this um, table that tells you which resistors to use for which voltage and uh, you would connect these to these Vout configuration pins. Now I have placed zero ohm resistors for now because um, I didn't really have enough time to dive deeply into this and to decide whether I would like to use the I squared C option or, uh, or the or resistors or both and what are the upsides and the downsides of either. So I kind of postponed this uh, investigation and just placed zero ohms resistors so that I can experiment with this, with this when I have the actual physical thing. Um, but basically this is the only th uh, thing we need to um, customize for this uh, IC. Oh, no, there's one more thing. There's also no, uh, an address selection pin where we need to apply a resistor. I think I, yes, I also did a zero ohm resistor there. But of course, because we have two battery charger modules that potentially um, work on the same I squared C bus, we will need um, different resistor values. So these are here, but that's, I mean, that's pretty trivial to, to figure out later. Um, other than this, what else do we have? Here are all the um, SCL, all the I squared C. Uh, lines that are pulled up. Then there are GPIOs that I'm not fully sure what they do, but they also pulled them up in the demo schematic, so I did the same. There is an alert output. It's also an open drain, so the, it's um, active when it's pulled low. And yeah, with all of these, I basically followed the uh, uh, manufacturer implementation and pulled them up with a 10k resistor to the internal 3.3 volt source. We don't need the internal 2.5 volt source apparently and the um, enable pins for each channel 
are broken out to, um, to the EPS as we have discussed before. The only thing, the only other thing worth noting here is that when you have a input, vo input voltage below 5.75 volts, you need to short int VCC um, to VN. And I have implemented this with this solder jumper. Um, so, I mean, for, for us, we don't need to do this because our battery voltage is 7.2 volts. But if you have a 1S battery pack, you will need to solder this short this together and again here we have the same footprint as for the battery charger it's just the same castellated holes so yeah i think that's all i wanted to mention for the ltm 4675 module so if we run the erc now just for fun we should get yeah um zero errors but a bunch of warnings these are mainly uh, simulation models that I did not um, uh, attach to a bunch of the symbols, um, mainly because I have never done simulation and I don't know anything about it. So yeah, I think this is nothing too drastic here. So far, so good. So this wraps up our walkthrough of the EPS schematic. In the next video, we are going to have a quick update on the structure. And in the one after that, we are starting the layout for this board. As always, I'm happy to read your comments if you have any thoughts about all of this. And thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.